So in my last video, I showed you guys this thing, which is basically a tiny Game Boy Zero based on Kite's Circuit Gym Kit. Again, I did a video all about it and what kind of games it can play, that kind of thing. So if you missed it, then definitely check that out. But in today's video, I'm gonna show you what goes into putting one together. Now, before I get into it, like I mentioned in the last video, I'm giving away the one that you'll see me put together in this video. I went ahead and extended the end date on that contest to give you a little bit more time to enter since I'm a little bit late with this video. Sorry about that, by the way. So if you wanna to enter to win that, check out the link in the description. Also, I wanna make a big disclaimer about this project and about the 3D printed parts in particular. It's not gonna be perfect. You really have to think of it more like one of those plastic model kits that you have to put together and then you have to sand it and paint it. The end result is really only as good as the amount of time and effort that you put into it. And even then, even if you put the work in, it's still handmade and it's not gonna be perfect. That said, I've been really happy with the results that I've been able to get and I'm gonna show you hopefully how to get there too. So I'm not trying to scare anybody away or anything like that, I just wanna set realistic expectations. All right, so with that out of the way, let's get started. All right, so here are all the parts that go into making this. And of course, links for all of these are in the blog post in the description. On this side are all of the electronic parts that come in Kite's kit. And on this side are all the parts I use to make it so that instead of having to chop up a Sega Dreamcast VMU, you can use that same kit from Kite to make a tiny Game Boy Zero instead. So Kite's kit comes with a screen, a speaker, a couple of connectors, and then of course the all-in-one board. Now these parts are unavailable right now, but Kite did tell me he'd have at least one more small batch available soon. So if you want to get some, make sure that you sign up for his mailing list. So this acts as kind of an expansion board for Raspberry Pi Zero, which is a great and cheap tiny computer that I've used in a bunch of projects. Uh, it's definitely starting to show its age at this point, but it's still got some life left in it for projects like this. You'll also need to get a battery separately. This is the one that I used and I'll link to it with all the other parts. Now over here, I've got a 3D printed shell. It's printed in resin, so the surface is nice and smooth. You can hardly see any layer lines. But as you can see, and like I mentioned earlier, it's gonna take some work to clean it up, sand it down and paint it and make it look really nice. Uh, but don't worry, I'll show you how to do all of that. I did make a couple of minor improvements since the last video. I adjusted the tolerances on the D-pad and all the buttons so they feel a lot nicer to use. I tweaked the size and shape of the charging port. And then I also added a couple of holes at the top so that you can see the status and charging LEDs on the board. I also removed the logo cutout, and instead I'm using a decal for that so that it's optional. This is a screen bracket for holding the screen in place, a laser cut acrylic screen lens with a vinyl bezel, some resin printed buttons, not quite as nice as injection molded, but they still look and feel great. These are some individual button membranes to go along with those since we obviously can't use the original VMU button membrane. A couple of pieces to extend the ribbon cable on the screen since it's shifted up a little bit in the new shell a couple of tactile switches for the L and R buttons, and then of course, some screws to hold everything together. Now, if you've got your own printers and you wanna print your own, I've got all the STL files up on Patreon for supporters to download. So first up, the printed parts. This is the first bigger project that I've done using resin printing, so there was a lot for me to learn. It looks amazing when you're done, but it's kind of a pain to get there. So after it's done printing, you have to give it an alcohol bath to remove any uncured resin. Then you have to remove the supports. I know this looks pretty wasteful because there are a ton of supports, but printing it at an angle like this actually gives you the best results. I like to snip the supports that will be visible just above the surface. You can sand down the nubs later, and then remove the rest by soaking it in hot water for a minute. That part's pretty satisfying. Then it's time to post cure in a curing station like this. That'll make it safe to touch without gloves and also toughen it up a little bit and make it easier to sand. By the way, this is about what it'll look like if you purchase them from me. Again, be aware that it will take some work to get it to look nice. These little dimples on the inside are from using that hot water trick to remove the supports, so that's why I only do that on the parts that you cannot see. Also, if you have any edges that aren't quite straight, maybe they're warped just a little bit, don't worry, you can heat those up with a hair dryer and press them against a flat surface to straighten them out. So now it's time to sand it, and you definitely want to do this outside and wear a mask because you really don't want to breathe in any of the dust from this. First, start with the edges on a flat surface. Glass works great to get these edges nice and smooth. You may need to take a razor to the inside of this lip here to clean up where any supports were touching. And then straighten up those edges with a file. You can sand the rest of the body lightly if you want. If you're gonna paint it, and especially if you're gonna prime it before painting it, that'll make it so you can't even see most of the layer lines. 
If you end up with any dimples where supports were, or if you nick it while you're cleaning it up or whatever, this stuff is great for filling in those spots. You can get it on Amazon, just apply it, let it dry, and then sand it down, and you won't even see it after you paint it. Awesome stuff. I like to add a couple of coats of primer, and then you can paint it whatever color you want. These are a couple of off-the-shelf paints that I found that are pretty close to that kind of creamy gray color that you see in a 30-year-old Game Boy. Uh, so you can use those if you want. They are a little dark, but they look pretty good. I wanted to get it as close as possible, so I mixed my own and then used an airbrush. Either way though, you're going to want to add a few layers of a clear coat to protect it when you're done. I used this stuff and it works great, just be aware that it will darken up your paint by a shade or two, so take that into account when you're picking the color. Now if you want, you can apply a decal for the logo. On the original one that I showed you guys a few weeks back, that was actually part of the model itself. But I found that it was an absolute pain to get the blue paint down in there after I had painted the rest of it without just making a mess. Plus, I realized not everybody's going to want that logo there to begin with. So I went ahead and took that out of the final model, and instead I'm using water slide decals. I'm including a few of them with the printed parts, or you can print your own. They're really easy to apply. You're going to want to lightly sand the area where you're going to apply it. Just to smooth it out, you don't even want to go all the way through the clear coat here. Just to smooth it out. Soak it in water for a few seconds, and then slide it on with something soft. Get it into place, remove the excess water, and press it down firmly. That's it. Just make sure that you add another clear coat on top of it to protect it and hold it in place. It doesn't look quite as nice as the original, but it still looks good and it's way easier to work with. Next up, let's get the board assembled. We need to attach the Raspberry Pi to the all-in-one board. Basically, we'll be connecting the two boards using these pads here, which you can see line up with all these pinholes on the Pi. I've got a soldering crash course video that I'll link to if you need some pointers there, but the idea is to press them together and add some solder in each of these holes. We'll also attach a couple points on the other side. These are the USB data test pads to connect this chip here at the top left to the USB port on the Pi as if it was plugged in. Before I do any of that though, I'm going to remove the USB and HDMI ports to make it thinner. If you do that, you can fit an 850 milliamp hour battery in there, which lasts a little over two hours. You don't have to do this if you're fine with having a much smaller battery though, but it isn't actually all that bad with a decent soldering and rework station, which I highly recommend if you're interested in these kinds of projects. You can get a decent one for under 100 bucks and a link to the one that I use below. Just blast each port with hot air for a couple of minutes until it comes loose. Do not pull on them, let them come loose on their own. If you pull on them before they're ready, you can damage the traces on the board. There, see how much thinner that is? Take a really close look at your work to make sure that you didn't bridge any of those pads. Depending on which ones are bridged, you could permanently damage your pie, so do not skip this part. Next, add some Kapton tape to cover up a couple of these metal bits so that we don't short anything on the board. Just make sure that you don't cover up these two pads right here. Now I'm gonna add a tiny amount of solder to each pad to tend them and make it much easier to connect the boards. Seriously, hardly any solder, and then I even like to go over it with a desoldering wick to make it so none of those stick up at all. This is a really handy trick for projects like this that use this type of soldering. Once that's done, go ahead and line up the pie with the outline on the board. Clamp the two boards together, but not too hard so that you don't break anything, and get to soldering. Again, check out that soldering video that I mentioned for some tips on doing this part. There are some test points on the other side that you can use to test continuity with the pinholes on the Pi to make sure that you got a good connection on each one of them. Now add a little bit of solder to these pads that you put the capped on tape around. Again, that's so that the microcontroller on the board is connected to the Pi's USB port. Make sure that you don't add too much and bridge the two, they are really close together. Next, we need to attach the right kind of connector to the battery, which comes in the kit. You don't have to do this if you don't want to, or if you don't feel comfortable doing it, you can just solder the battery directly to the board with these pads below the connector. But I'm gonna go ahead and do it, carefully peel off the capped on tape, fold this tiny board up, and remove the leads that come on it. Solder on the ones that came in Kite's kit, making sure you get the polarity right, and be careful, these batteries are more than happy to go up in flames if you puncture them or you heat them up too much. Uh, so if you're inexperienced, then find someone who is, or just attach the battery directly to the board. Put the tape back how it was and fold the board back down, and you're done. Now for the speaker. That part's really easy, it just attaches to these two pads here like this, and I like to add some double-sided tape to hold the speaker in place in this cutout here in the middle. Finally, we need to get the L and R buttons ready. They'll sit in the printed shell like this, they just pop into place, and we're going to attach them to this other JST connector that comes in the kit. The yellow one goes to the left, and the red one goes to right. And then the black one is ground. You can see that they're sharing that connection here between the two buttons. So now we can put it all together. 
This is the screen that comes in Kite's kit. As you can see, the cable is pretty short. That's a problem because I raised the screen up just a little bit so that the proportions match the Game Boy better. So I've got an extension ribbon and a coupler. You insert the ribbons like so, press the tabs into place, and there, problem solved. This bracket will hold the screen in place. The ribbon goes up to the top, and you just gently press the screen into the bracket. Be really careful doing this because these screens are pretty fragile. Also, make sure that you sand down the inside of the shell so that the screen can sit flat against it. Slide the whole thing down over these screw posts and add these spacers to make sure it's pressed against the front. Now attach and add all of the buttons and membranes. I did not bother sanding these by the way, they look pretty good as is, but I did add a clear coat to mine. Make sure the start and select buttons go in there with the buttons towards the top, like you see here. Now connect the screen's ribbon cable to the board, add the power switch in the top. Now I ended up using an FDM printed switch. It doesn't look quite as nice as a resin printed one, but it's much stronger than a resin printed one and only a tiny bit of it shows anyway. It goes in there like this and hooks onto the power switch so that that can be placed where it should be on a Game Boy. Go ahead and screw the board into the front of the shell. Make sure that you use these two screw holes in the middle because the other ones go all the way through to the back. Add the battery to the back. You might want to add some double sided tape to hold it in place. Attach the two JST connectors for the battery and the L and R buttons and screw it all together. Last piece is the screen lens. These are laser cut out of a really thin piece of acrylic with a vinyl bezel added that I cut with a Cricut machine. You're gonna want some double-sided tape for this. Just apply some thin strips all around the edge and make sure you get all the dust out of there using some canned air and drop it into place. And that's it. Again, I've got the STL files up on Patreon to print your own parts, and everything's available on my site as well. But again, please remember, as you've seen in this video, the shell requires some sanding, maybe some filling, and some painting to make it look good. All right, guys, well, I think that about covers everything. As usual, if there's anything that I forgot or I need to go back and correct, I'll do that in the blog post that's in the description. Also, don't forget, I'm giving away the one that you just watched me put together in this video. So if you want a chance to win that, check out that same blog post that's in the description. As usual, thanks for watching all the way to the end, and I will see you guys next time.